Well, good morning and welcome to our service this morning. Special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us, those of you joining us online. Uh, I trust that you can experience God with us. We're going to jump right in this morning. Uh, we're picking up kind of where we left off, but like I said last week, uh, hopefully the goal is that each of these messages can be taken individually, but by the end, there'll be a collective whole. Last week, uh, we looked at the word grace, and, and our key verse comes from John chapter 1 and verse 14, where John tells us that the word, that is Jesus, Uh, the Son of God, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, that is God's glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And we looked at the word grace last week. Um, If you can advance me. Um, We we looked at the word grace last week and uh, talked about kind of its definition Um, talked about how essentially the grace of God reveals the glory of God and uh, how John brings Moses into the picture kind of as this lesser Jesus, so to speak. Here we go. There's a definition of grace. God's undeserved, unmerited favor. And Paul uses it to refer to the freedom of salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. We understand we need grace uh, because we're all sinners. And then recapping, again, Moses as kind of the lesser Jesus. Moses uh, points to grace. Jesus performs grace. Moses reports the words of God. Jesus is the word of God. And the law that Moses was given for the Israelites mirrors the light of God, and God himself is the light of God. And we ended it with this thought. Because we've received grace upon grace... We have seen the glory of God, and that is that we, if you have experienced the grace of God, that is his unmerited favor, the freedom of salvation, and you've received that, you have seen the glory of God. And the invitation then is to share that, reflect that back. We're learning something about who God is, and his grace gives us a, a, a insight into his glory. The same... Uh, is, is true of this idea of the fullness of his truth. And we find ourselves kind of in this tug of war, I think, as human beings, tending between one end of the spectrum or the other, where we want to be gracious individuals and we struggle to know how to be gracious without, with, and maintain truth. And so, and the opposite being true. We, we want to be truthful and we want to hold to the truth. And sometimes in doing that, we sacrifice the grace. And so how, what does it look like for us to be full of both? Because what we're learning is that God is full of both grace and truth. He doesn't, tr- grace is not diminished so that truth can, can be elevated and, and the inverse of that, whereas truth is not diminished so that grace can be elevated. And we're going to see this come to a culmination, okay? We're, we're going to get there. This morning we're going to look at the word truth. There is a an interaction that happens in John's gospel, you can turn there, John 18. Uh, if, if you've grown up in church, which most of you here have, I think, um, this, w- this interaction will be familiar to you. This is, Paul, this is Pilate and Jesus uh, before Jesus' crucifixion, when Jesus is standing trial before Pilate. And Pilate's trying to find a reason, a justifiable reason to execute Jesus, because that's what the people want. And he's interrogating Jesus, so to speak. And and we come to this place in John uh, chapter 18, where Pilate actually asks this question, what is truth? Now, this is one of these moments in Scripture that I'm certain I've read before, but just have read right past, until you're looking for it. And then these kind of things jump out the page at you. But here's, here's the conversation. And just a few verses prior, you can take in more of the context uh, if you'd like. But in just a few verses prior, Pilate, uh, the, the qu- what's in question is Jesus' kingship because that's something that's worthy of execution. If, if you have an individual who's claiming to be king, uh, there's only one of those. And so that's, that's in direct opposition to the Roman Empire. And so what Pilate's basically trying to do is get Jesus to say that he's king. And Jesus talks about, in the verses prior, his kingdom, not being of this earth. 
And so we pick up in verse 37 then with, with Pilate asking or making this statement. You are a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then Pilate asked this question, what is truth? What is truth? It's the question that I think our world wrestles with, that maybe we've wrestled with and we continue to wrestle with. What is truth? And the answer, uh, just to give you the punchline, is that truth is not found in something. It's found in someone. And Jesus answers the question before it's even asked, that I'm the truth. I, I came to be witness to the truth. And there's several then implications for us in this. Jesus is the revelation of, of God. In the same way that Jesus reveals the grace of God, Jesus reveals the truth of God. Okay? He's the witness to it. It's the reason that he was born. And so there's several then implications for us. Three that we're going to look at. Uh, Implication number one, that there is a truth. Number two, that Jesus is the key witness to that truth. And then more of like an exhortation, but don't be like Pilate. And that's where we're going to land. So first and foremost, what we, what we learn, the implications for us in this interaction is that the, we, we learn that there is a truth. Okay, there is a truth. This, and this truth, it's not a truth, it's the truth. Okay, Jesus didn't say that I came to bear witness to a truth. He said, I came to bear witness to the truth. The truth, okay? And this truth exists outside of the world. The world does not make up this truth. The world does not shape this truth. It is the truth. Not a truth for me and a different truth for you. That's kind of the world that we're living in right now. And the reality is it's the world that we live in right now, but... I think it's the world that people, humans, have been living in for thousands of years. Because Pilate was dealing with the same question that we're dealing with today. It's, it's not new. And I tend to, in these types of situations where we think we're living in unprecedented times, and I recognize that the technology age has presented new challenges that no other generations have had to deal with. But human beings are human beings. And Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. And in some of these arenas, I think we, we tend to think that we, we live in unprecedented times. And in some ways, yes, we do. But Solomon was wise, I think, in his statement that there's nothing new under the sun. Human beings have been human beings for thousands of years. And they, they wrestled with this idea of truth then, and we wrestle with it today as well. Now, I recognize that it's a different day, and there might have been a time where we wouldn't have had to stand up here and preach the absoluteness of truth, because it was sort of just assumed within the culture. That's not the world we live in, and I recognize that, but people wrestling with the absoluteness of truth has been happening for thousands of years. Where we find ourselves today is kind of in this space where if, if you're one that affirms absolute truth, you you might and maybe have or will be sort of ridiculed in a number of different ways. But one uh, idea is that people who affirm absolute truth are misguided. Misguided for a number of reasons, but primarily that first and foremost, uh, people who come in opposition to absolute truth would say that those who believe in it or affirm it are misguided because there is no God. So if there, if there is no God... Who exist, then there's, there's no absolute truth that exists outside of this world. Or that even if there is a God, there's no way that we can know him. Therefore, we can't know what he's thinking. And so these are kind of arguments that are used to, uh, to come up against this idea that there is a truth that exists outside of this world, a truth that exists outside of me, that I'm not making it up for myself and you're not making it up for yourself. And one of those arguments is, that, is to diminish the existence of God. And that even if he did exist, we, we can't know what he thinks. And therefore, there can't be absolute truth. Or that um, absolute truth is viewed as, or someone who or holds to it or affirms it, it, is accused of being arrogant or intolerant. That 
truth itself has been turned into this root of this ugly root of, of bigotry and intolerance uh, and prejudice. And we diminish truth then to the term that's often used, relativism, where, where everything becomes relative. And this is when we take truth out of the absolute realm, meaning that it, there's, there's something that governs it that's larger than ourselves, that exists outside of me and outside of this world, that is not influenced by me or this world. When we take truth out of that realm and we, we bring it into the relative, and what's true for me? And we begin to influence then what truth is. What I think has been happening uh, to us as people is that we're looking for fulfillment in life. And so we're, what we're trying to do as human beings is experience life to the full. And so we do all the things that, that we think are fulfilling, that bring us fullness of life. And then we call that experience truth. That's kind of relative truth. Whatever, I, I want to experience life to the full, and so I'm going to do all the things that I think will help me do that, and then I'm going to call that truth. That's relativism. And I think that's kind of where we find ourselves in this day and age. And it's why we find ourselves in this place of saying that what's true for me is not necessarily true for you, because what I think is fullness of life might not be the same as what you think is fullness of life. And so I'm going to call my experience truth, and you can call your experience truth, and we're going to be humble, and we're going to be receptive of everyone. Respectful, tolerant, peaceful. And so absolute truth has kind of also been then deemed sort of immoral because of its intolerance, because of its uh, exclusivity, so to speak. And the, the moral thing, the respectful thing, is to be be a person who is relative to let you believe what you believe and let me believe what I believe. To speak to the idea of kind of where we are in our culture and again to the, to the fact that human beings have been human beings for a very long time. Um, way back in 1987, there was a political philosopher named Alan Bloom who wrote a book entitled The Closing of the American Mind. And in his book, Alan describes how deeply woven into the American fabric of the, the fabric of American life this view of truth is, this relative view of truth is. Now, mind you, this was 35 years ago. And as I read this quote from his book, just have in your mind, human beings are human beings. Okay? This is 35 years ago, Alan Bloom writing. There is one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. If this belief is put to the test, one can count on the student's reaction. They will be uncomprehending. That anyone should regard relativism as not self-evident astonishes them, as though he were calling into question 2 plus 2 equals 4. These are things you don't think about. The students' backgrounds are as various as America can provide. Some are religious, some atheist, some are to the left, some to the right. Some intend to be scientists, some humanists or professionals or businessmen. Some are poor, some rich. They are unified only in their relativism and in their allegiance to equality. And the two are related in moral intention. The relativity, the relativity of truth is not a theoretical insight, but a moral postulate. The condition of a free society, or though they see it. This is what's woven into our fabric. This is what's, what a political philosopher said 35 years ago about America. Now just take a look at where, where we're at. Okay? And so, again, human beings have been human beings, and this has been happening for a while. But this is so ingrained in us that, that to come against the idea, it, it, as Alan Bloom says, is to come against even the fact something like 2 plus 2 equals 4. It, we can't, they can't comprehend it. And this is being woven into the fabric of our society. This is the world and the culture in which we live in. That, that relativism is viewed as the moral uh, thing. That a moral society is a relativistic society. And to believe in absolute truth is then considered immoral. 
The problem with relativism is that it's self-contradicting. And this is where it begins to break down if you actually take some time to think about it. But, but to believe it, that everything is relative, for example, is to say something like this. And this is what is said. That there is no absolute truth and everyone should believe it. That's kind of the agenda. There is no absolute truth and everyone should believe it. But you contradict yourself in making the statement because in making the statement, you want people to believe. But the statement you, you're making is that there are no statements that everyone should believe. See how we're contradicting ourselves here. We want everyone to believe that they shouldn't believe that there are absolutes. But in making the statement, you're recognizing that there shouldn't be something that everyone believes. It's the hidden agenda of relativism. It's the equivalent of basically saying in a shorter way, we, believe abs we, we absolutely reject absolutes. We absolutely reject absolutes. The self-contradiction is the testimony to the fact that we can't live without absolute truth. It's, it's kind of in the same way, uh, whether we acknowledge it or not, kind of inborn in us, this need for there to be some kind of absolute. And I think we're working to suppress that reality within us but it continues to bubble to the surface and the self-contradicting nature of the statements that we make indicate that also then it's no surprise that relativism is unbiblical jesus speaks to it himself in the statement that he makes that for this very reason i was born and came into the world to testify to the truth jesus also speaking in john chapter 14 6 uh, familiar to us, says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the first thing that we learn in Jesus' interaction with Pilate here is that there is, a, there, there is a truth, the truth. Jesus didn't come to bear witness to a truth. He came to bear witness to the truth, a truth that exists outside of this world and that comes from God and gives meaning to this world. And that truth is unchanging. Secondly, then, Jesus is the key witness Jesus is the key witness to this truth. We can't, the essence, if we're asking the question of what is truth and we're looking for an answer, the only place we can go is to Jesus. He is the key witness for what this truth, the truth is. We recognize that Jesus is gone now and he's sent our spirit and that's critical. That's critical for us and for the Christian life. But Jesus was born to bear witness. He is the witness. And so there's sometimes when we need to go look at Jesus' life to see what that witness was. I mean, again, it's critical for us to understand he's left us his spirit. But in this case, we need to be looking at Jesus. He's the witness. So how do we do that? We read the Gospels. John Piper says this, the way you credit a witness is by listening long and hard to him to see if you sense that he is cunning, if, to see if you sense that he is conning you or if he has the ring of truth. That's what you must do with the Gospels. You, you read the Gospels. You read and you reread the Gospels. And you look at Jesus and, and you examine and you see, is, in essence, is Jesus conning us or is his testimony true? Is it valid? Does it hold up? Is it consistent throughout? And I think you will find that it is. That, that the testimony of the gospel writers of Jesus' life recorded there bears witness to the truth, the truth that he represents. To speak to the power of the gospel uh, and, and the way it gives us insight into Jesus' life, uh, a man, uh, a, a doctor, uh, E.V. I won't be able to say his last name. He's French. Ryu. R-I-E-U. -E it's French, okay? He was a scholar who, both, uh, who translated both the ancient poet Homer and, and the four Gospels from Greek into modern English. So he's dealing with, with secular literature and the Gospels. And he's doing this with, uh, with really no commitment to any, anything spiritual. And so we're getting kind of what you might call an objective opinion here. But after doing this, 
this is what Dr. Uh, Ryu says. I got the deepest feeling that I possibly could have expected, speaking of his work with the Gospels. I got the deepest feeling that I possibly could have expected. It, meaning the Gospels, changed me. My work changed me. And I came to the conclusion that these words bear the seal of the Son of Man and God. And they're the Magna Carta of the human spirit. Here's a guy who, I think, by all counts, goes into this objectively with no spiritual intention and after having spent time in the gospels translating them comes to the conclusion that these words bear the seal of the son of man and of god that the testimony is true and so if we want to answer the question of what is truth we sit with the gospels we read and we reread the gospels and we listen carefully and earnestly and openly with a willingness to do the truth if we see it And that might be the key right there, with a willingness to do the truth when we see it. Because we might recognize the truth, but how willing am I to actually do that truth? So if we're we're completely objective here, we're earnestly seeking, carefully looking, and when we find the truth, are we willing then to acknowledge it and do it? The witness of the writers and the testimony of Jesus will prove their credibility. Reading with a willingness to do the truth if you see it. This is where I think it's critically important that as we read, we invite God into that space to reveal the truth to us. Because here's, uh, I'm not, I don't want to say this in an accusatory fashion, but just as a word of caution. What we might, apart from God, be inclined to do is run to the Gospels, find a, a word of Jesus, an action of Jesus, an attitude of Jesus, pull it out of context, and weaponize it for the truth that we want to hammer someone over the head with. And that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, We need to be very careful that as we're reading that God is revealing to us accurately who Jesus is, what the truth is in Jesus Christ, in the witness of Jesus Christ. And to do that, we we must read in context. And here's, here's the difficult thing, I think, for us, is that in my opinion, and, and you can argue with me on this, the life that Jesus lived, uh, when it comes to this idea of truth, it, it frustrates us sometimes. Because what you'd like for Jesus to do, or what you'd like for the pastor to do, is stand up here and tell you what the right and wrong thing is, or what the truthful thing is, in any given situation. Okay? Okay? And any number of arenas. I could list them off all day. Uh, is it right to, to drink alcohol or not? Should we smoke? Should we do drugs? Should we vote for a certain person or not? What is the truthful thing to do in any given situation? And what we want Jesus to do, and what sometimes you want the pastor to do, is stand up here and take a stance and say, this is, this is what is right. This is what is true in this situation. And when you read the Gospels, you're not going to find Jesus doing that. We have to make that application for ourselves and, and walking closely with Him. This is where His revelation in our, in our hearts is just so critical. We can't pull out things that we want to justify the stances that we want to take. Now, that doesn't diminish the fact that Jesus is true. And, and, we're not, and I don't think we're diving into a relative... Uh, the, the arena of relativism in saying that. Because the reality is it may work itself out a little bit differently as Jesus convicts you. But it's rooted in Jesus Christ, in his life, in his witness, in his attitude, in his words. And we're going to, to the best of my human abilities, I hope that I'll be able to help guide us into that in the next couple of weeks, where we look at the life of Jesus and, and we we hear his words and we see his actions that might be helpful for us as we apply these truths and this grace to our own lives experientially, okay? But let us be very careful that Jesus is the witness for the truth that we hold to, to the absoluteness of the truth that we hold to. And sometimes it's, I think that's frustrating for us because it's not as black and white as we'd like it to be. 
So, there is a truth. It's revealed in Jesus and in Jesus only. He's the key witness. And then finally, the exhortation for us is this. Don't be like Pilate. Don't be like Pilate. Pilate's response to Jesus in the statement that he makes, that I am the witness to the truth, is this question of what is truth? What is truth? It's kind of, I think, Pilate's way of getting himself off the hook. We can't accuse Pilate of being relativistic. We can't accuse Pilate of adhering to absolutes because basically what he's saying is, I'm not saying, this is Pilate, uh, this is me being Pilate, I'm not going to say that truth is absolute, but I'm also not going to say that truth is relative. I'm just going to say, I don't know. It could be. It could be absolute. It could be relative. And I'm going to withhold judgment on that. And I don't know, maybe you're here this morning and that's the position you want to take. And maybe you don't take it in, in all arenas, but maybe we take it in certain places at certain times. Because in certain crowds, we don't want to come across as, in a certain way that might get us ridiculed, and so we'll take a little bit softer stance there. We'll take the more I don't know approach when really deep down inside, you might know, or maybe you don't. And so I don't know, I mean, we, I, I want to be critical of pilot here, but as I sit a little bit with my own self, I have to ask this question like, Am I in the I don't know place sometimes? And if I'm honest with myself, I think maybe I am. Like, depending on the situation, I might just go with the I don't know answer just because it's easier. It's easier than taking a stance one way or the other, really. And that's where Pilate finds himself. I'm not going to be accused of either. I just don't know. It could be. But the reality is, as we think more deeply about that, kind of in the same way that as you begin to think about the statement of, that, that relativism makes, being self-contradictory, when it comes to this position of I don't know, most of us really don't practice that. We might say it, but we don't practice that. And here's, here's the reality for us, that we, we only suspend judgment in, in areas that seem unimportant or troublesome to us, in areas that seem unimportant or troublesome to us. But you probably won't meet a person who has trouble believing in moral absolutes when, for example, they've been punched in the nose. If you've been punched in the nose, uh, we immediately assume that the aggressor is wrong. And we begin to be governed by this force of moral absoluteness, that it's wrong to just punch somebody in the face. I mean, I think most of us agree that to that. Therefore, we're indicating by default by the practice of our lives that we recognize there's some kind of moral absoluteness that exists outside ourselves. We agree on that. So, so we don't always suspend judgment. We have some judgments. We just suspend them in places that don't seem important to us or that, that don't directly affect us. But we tend to, to immediately have some view of this when it directly impacts us. And if, for instance, just fleshing us out a little farther, this incident of face punching would go to court and the judge would say, uh, not guilty to the aggressor because truth is relative. And for him or her, it felt right to punch the other person in the face. And so therefore, I, I had to say not guilty because it was right for them. And in this realm of relativism, that would be accurate. If it felt right, if it was true for them, what, what's the argument against? The reality is we know that that doesn't feel right. That doesn't sit right, and we don't operate that way when it begins to directly impact us. And so we might be inclined to say like Pilate in some situations, I don't know. But the truth is when my personal interest is at stake, when my property, when my family, when my, uh, when my personal self, you name it, when, when those things are at stake, I won't act as though there is no truth. I won't. When I'm personally impacted by this, I will pretty directly have strong convictions about what I feel is, is right and wrong. And most of the time, that's true for us. We don't actually live out of a place of I don't know. We, we do know something. We have convictions about something. Some things. Uh, when it, when it boils down to it, and we are directly impacted by those choices. In light of that idea, then, 
we must realize how much is at stake in Jesus' claim to bring truth. It's much more than just a matter of our earthly possessions or our physical lives. It's a matter of eternity. It's a matter of eternity. The, the statement that Jesus makes, that he is the witness to the truth, that he is truth himself, is a matter of eternity. Jesus was not born to keep secret the truth of God. He was born and came into the world to bear witness to the truth, the unchanging, absolute truth of God. I pray that we realize uh, in this statement how much is at stake. We take up the gospel and we read it. And we find, as Jesus would say later on, or John, John says later on, that then we'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. There is a, the truth, a truth. It's in Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He's revealing to us another element of who God is. Uh, he's the only witness to it. So if you want to know what the truth is, we, we've got to sit with Jesus' life. And we've got to do it not independent of God's influence in our lives, speaking to us, just giving us discernment and wisdom into it, revelation for application in our lives. And then let us not live in this place of I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a dangerous place. Uh, more so than just our possessions, but the reality of our eternity. Uh, let us be impacted by the truth of God's word and have that truth then set us free. Let's pray. Father God, <clears throat> thank you for the witness of Jesus in this world. For the fullness of your grace and your truth that were revealed in him. When he took on flesh and became a man and walked and dwelt among us. For the example of his life. For his words, his actions, his attitudes. God, may we seek earnestly after truth. The truth. The truth that is, that is only found in Jesus Christ. Give us wisdom. Give us uh, humility. Uh, and an earnestness to seek after that truth. To be in your word. To be of your word. God, when we find it, that we would apply it and apply it appropriately in ways that you, um, that ways that you govern us to. May your truth impact us and set us free, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.